Hi there, it's Friday the 6th of March 2020. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. There are only a few developments in digital taxation this week. I'll quickly run through them. Firstly, Spain's 3% DST bill has been introduced into Parliament. For a copy of the bill, please go to our website or app. Secondly, the UK government has released a policy document in regard to a future negotiation of a free trade agreement with the US. Interestingly, the document notes that the UK's 2% DST, which is proposed to be introduced effective the 1st of April 2020, could be used as a bargaining chip in the negotiations. For a copy of the policy document, please go to our website or app. Commentators have suggested that two decisions this week issued by the European Court of Justice have reduced the prospects for a successful challenge to the DSTs which are being implemented in various EU member states based on EU rules such as state aid and the freedom of establishment. I discussed these two cases, Vodafone and Tesco, in the Europe section of this video. And finally, in regard to Pillar 2, Ireland's Finance Minister has stated that he remains to be convinced of the need for the proposals under consideration on minimum taxation, which go beyond the objective of addressing the tax challenges of digitalisation. In Hong Kong, the tax authorities have issued a redacted private ruling in regard to the PE status of a foreign limited partnership which planned to set up a representative office in Hong Kong. The ruling is limited to domestic tax law. Due to the intended operations of the rep office, the ruling concludes that its activities would not be of a preparatory or auxiliary character and thus it would constitute a fixed place of business PE under domestic law. The foreign limited partnership would therefore be considered to be carrying on a trade or business in Hong Kong. For a copy of this ruling, please go to our website or app. Also in Hong Kong, the tax authorities have issued a press release which states that Hong Kong and China have entered into an arrangement for the automatic exchange of CBC reports, effective for accounting periods which begin on or after the 1st of January 2018. For a copy of the press release, please go to our website or app. In India, the Authority for Advanced Rulings has issued a decision in regard to the capital gains exemption under the India-Mauritius Treaty for profits on the transfer of shares. As you know, the treaty was amended in 2016 to limit the exemption to the transfer of shares which were acquired by the Mauritius Company before the 1st of April 2017. That was the situation in this case. But nevertheless, the AAR held that the treaty exemption was not available. In 2011, a Mauritius Category 1 global business license company was formed by a South African company to own a 27% shareholding in an Indian company which itself was formed as a joint venture company to bid for a major project in India. Importantly, the Mauritius company was formed just before the bid was submitted. The South African parent company had participated in the bidding process up to that point. 
Also, the Mauritius company lacked substance. The AAR described the Mauritius company in this way. It served as conduit for routing funds for South African-based holding companies. The shares of joint venture were bought in the name of applicant, though the beneficial owners were the holding companies in South Africa. The applicant kept on noting and endorsing decisions of the holding company in the board meetings without any contribution or discussion about the decision-making process. In short, the applicant was not in a position to create any value for the joint venture. The applicant was incorporated a few days before the JV was formed and has no independent sources of funds or sources of income, nor has any fiscal independence. All the funds are with the holding companies. The applicant has no tangible assets or business activities except for owning the shares of the JV. The AAR held that the treaty exemption was not available to shelter the profit on sale of the shares in the Indian Joint Venture Company due to the application of the so-called look-at principle from the 2012 decision of the Supreme Court in the Vodafone indirect share transfer case. In other words, when the facts are looked at objectively, the conclusion is that the Mauritius company was interposed between the South African parent company and the Indian joint venture company solely for tax avoidance purposes. So the AAR denied the treaty exemption based on the common law look at principle, despite the fact that the India Mauritius Treaty contains no anti avoidance rules. The MLI does not apply to that treaty, and India's domestic law GAR does not apply due to the fact that the shares were acquired before the 1st of April 2017. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Korea, the Supreme Court has decided a case in regard to whether Luxembourg CCAVs and CCAFs qualify for treaty benefits under the Korea-Luxembourg Treaty. A number of CCAVs and CCAFs held shares and bonds issued by Korean companies. The Korean companies paid dividends and interest on the shares and bonds. The issue in the case was whether Korean withholding tax could be reduced under the Korea-Luxembourg Treaty. An important point to note is that the case concerns dividends and interest paid in the period from 2006 to 2011. The facts therefore occurred before the changes made by the 2012 protocol. Amongst other things, the 2012 protocol deleted the former Article 28 from the treaty. The former Article 28, which was present in a number of Luxembourg treaties, excludes from treaty benefits the so-called 1929 holding companies and similar holding companies. The special Luxembourg tax regime which applied to those companies ended in 2011. Please hit the pause button to study the former Article 28. The Supreme Court held that the CCAVs and CCAFs were not covered by the former Article 28. It also held that the CCAVs and CCAFs are Luxembourg tax residents and beneficial owners of the dividends and interest, and therefore they qualify for the treaty benefits. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In last week's ITB, I mentioned that Malaysia had released an economic stimulus package in response to COVID-19. This was one of the last official acts of the former Prime Minister, Dr Mahathir, who was replaced as Prime Minister last weekend. For a copy of the government document which describes the economic stimulus package, please go to our website or app.
And also in Malaysia, the tax authorities have issued three service tax policy documents. The first is on inbound taxable services. The second is on the provision of taxable services within a group of companies. And the third concerns the service tax exemption for accommodation services as part of the government's economic stimulus package. For a copy of the three documents, please go to our website or app. In the Philippines, as I mentioned in last week's ITB, the Satira Bill is currently before the Senate. This week, the Department of Finance issued a press release which states that when Satira is enacted, the corporate tax position in the Philippines will be highly competitive when compared with other members of ASEAN and in particular, Thailand. For a copy of this press release, please go to our website or app. The European Court of Justice has decided three cases, all of which originate from Hungary. They are Vodafone, which deals with Hungary's special tax on the turnover of telecommunications operators. Tesco, which deals with Hungary's special tax on undertakings in the retail trade sector. And Google, which deals with Hungary's tax on advertising turnover, and in particular, its reporting and penalty provisions. The first two cases, Vodafone and Tesco, share most of the same issues. Although the two cases were not formally joined, and thus the court gave separate decisions in each case, the court did issue a combined press release summarising both cases. And so I will cover both cases together. In both cases, the taxpayer is a Hungarian subsidiary of a parent company which is established in another EU member state either the UK or the Netherlands. Also in both cases, the relevant special tax was applied to the taxpayer's turnover on a progressive rate basis. According to the court, on a steeply progressive rate basis in Tesco's case, starting with a 0% tax rate band. Also in both cases, the only taxpayers which fell within the 0% tax rate band were owned by Hungarian persons, whereas the taxpayers falling within the higher tax rate bands were predominantly owned by persons of other member states. The court considered these issues in the two cases. Firstly, in both cases, the EU state aid rules. Secondly, in both cases, the EU freedom of establishment and the prohibition against discrimination. And thirdly, in the Vodafone case, the compatibility of the special tax with the EU's VAT directive. The first issue is state aid. The two taxpayers argued that the 0% tax rate band was a de facto exemption granted to certain taxpayers owned by Hungarian persons, and that exemption constituted illegal state aid. The court rejected that argument on the basis that even if that exemption is illegal state aid, that can't be used by the taxpayers to defeat their liabilities for the taxes. The court said this in the Vodafone case. The tax burden borne by Vodafone is the result of a general tax, the revenue from which is transferred to the state budget. That tax not being specifically allocated to the funding of a tax advantage for which a particular category of taxable persons qualify. It follows that even if the de facto exemption from the special tax for which some taxable persons qualify may be classified as state aid, that tax is not hypothecated to the exemption measure. It follows that any illegality under EU law of the de facto exemption from the special tax 
for which some taxable persons qualify is not capable of affecting the legality of that tax itself. So that Vodafone cannot rely before the national courts on the unlawfulness of that exemption in order to avoid payment of that tax or to obtain repayment of tax paid. An almost identical statement is in the Tesco decision. The second issue concerns the freedom of establishment and the prohibition against discrimination. The court held that the progressive nature of the taxes, which causes the taxes to be borne mainly by taxpayers owned by persons of other member states, is not discriminatory and therefore the taxes don't breach either the freedom of establishment or the prohibition against discrimination. In the combined press release, the court succinctly described its view. The fact that those special taxes, the application of which to turnover is progressive, are mainly borne by undertakings owned by persons of other member states due to the fact that those undertakings achieve the highest turnover in the Hungarian markets concerned, reflects the economic reality of those markets and does not constitute discrimination against those undertakings. And the third issue concerns only Vodafone. Is the special tax on the turnover of telecommunications operators compatible with the EU VAT directive? The court held that there would be a lack of compatibility with the VAT directive only if the Hungarian special tax has the essential characteristics of VAT, which it does not. According to the court, it lacks two of the four essential characteristics of a VAT. It does not provide for the charging of the tax at each stage of the production and distribution process. And it does not provide for a right to deduction of the tax paid during the preceding stages of that process. As I've already noted, commentators have stated that these two decisions have reduced the prospects for a successful challenge to the digital services taxes which are being implemented in various EU member states. Although the DSTs don't use a progressive rate scale, they do generally use a large turnover threshold, which has the effect of imposing the tax only on large multinationals, similar to the effect of the progressive rate scale with the Hungarian special taxes. For a copy of the two decisions and the combined press release, please go to our website or app. The third of the ECJ's three cases is Google, which concerns Hungary's tax on advertising turnover, and in particular, its reporting and penalty provisions. The taxpayer is Google Island Limited, an Irish incorporated company. It provided online advertisements which were mainly in the Hungarian language, or which were mainly on internet pages which were in the Hungarian language. This made the taxpayer liable for Hungary's tax on advertising revenue. But the case does not concern that liability. Instead, the case concerns two aspects of the compliance rules in regard to the tax, the reporting obligation and the penalty provisions. In regard to both of these matters, the taxpayer argued that the compliance rules breach the EU's freedom to provide services. In regard to the first aspect, the reporting obligation, the court held that there was no breach of the freedom to provide services. The court's press release summarising the case says this. The court held that the principle of the freedom to provide services does not preclude Hungarian legislation which imposes an obligation to submit a tax declaration on suppliers of advertising services 
established in another member state for the purposes of their liability to the Hungarian tax on advertising. That is the case despite the fact that suppliers of such services established in Hungary are exempt from that obligation on the ground that they are subject to obligations to submit a tax declaration or to register on the basis of liability to all other taxes applicable in Hungary. But a different conclusion was reached in regard to the second aspect, the penalty provisions. The penalties imposed on foreign suppliers for non-compliance with the reporting obligation are severe. One day late produces a penalty of 31,000 euros, with the maximum penalty of 3.1 million euros reached after only five days. By the way, if this sounds familiar, it's because I recently covered an article on this topic in ITB. The court's press release says this. The court held that the principle of the freedom to provide services precludes Hungarian legislation, which fines such suppliers of services for non-compliance with the obligation to submit a tax declaration in a series of fines issued within several days capable of amounting to several million euros, without the competent authority giving those suppliers of services the time necessary to comply with their obligations or the opportunity to submit their observations, or having itself examined the seriousness of the infringement before adopting its final decision fixing the total amount of those fines. In that regard, the court notes that the amount of the fine that would be imposed on suppliers of advertising services established in Hungary who failed to comply with a similar obligation to submit a tax declaration or to register contrary to the general provisions of national tax legislation is significantly less and is not increased in the event of continued failure to comply with such an obligation in the same proportions, nor necessarily within such a short period of time. For a copy of this decision and the court's press release, please go to our website or app. The European Commission has presented a proposal for a European climate law, which will enshrine in legislation the EU's political commitment to climate neutrality by 2050. As part of this exercise, the Commission has launched public consultations in the form of so-called inception impact assessments on two taxation initiatives a future carbon border adjustment mechanism and a review of the energy taxation directive. Both items request public comments by the 1st of April. For a copy of the Commission's press release and details of the two public consultations, please go to our website or app. The European Commission's Tax Commissioner Gentiloni gave a speech yesterday on the EU's taxation policies. For a copy of the speech, please go to our website or app. In Finland, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the increased tax depreciation, which is available for machinery, equipment and similar fixed assets, effective the 1st of January 2020. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Norway, the government has launched a public consultation in regard to a proposal to introduce withholding tax on outbound payments of interest, royalties and possibly equipment rentals. Public comments are requested by the 27th of May. For a copy of the consultation document, please go to our website or app. In Spain, the government has introduced into Parliament a bill for the financial transactions tax. You'll remember that the previous bill for the tax lapsed 
when parliamentary elections were held in 2019. The new bill is not materially different from the previous bill. Accordingly, Spain's FTT will have a rate of 0.2% and will apply to the acquisition of shares in publicly listed companies with market capitalization exceeding 1 billion euros and depository receipts which represent such shares, with some exceptions. As you probably know, Spain is a member of the group of 10 EU member states which, since 2013, have been trying to use the Enhanced Cooperation Procedure for the adoption of an EU FTT directive. And, like France and Italy have done, Spain wants to introduce its domestic law FTT while still pursuing the EU FTT directive. In Argentina, the government has introduced into Congress a bill which will make changes to the so-called knowledge economy regime. You'll remember that the new government suspended the operation of this regime shortly after it took office. Let me take you through the key changes which are proposed in the bill. Here are the major proposed changes to the conditions for companies to qualify under the regime. Firstly, the condition that companies must spend a minimum amount on workforce training or R&D will remain, but the formula for determining the minimum amount will be eased for micro companies and SMEs. Secondly, and similarly, the condition that companies must derive a minimum amount of their total revenues from the export of goods or services will remain, but the formula for determining the minimum amount will be eased for micro companies and SMEs. And thirdly, the condition that companies must derive at least 70% of their revenues from the promoted activities will be amended to allow that condition to be applied flexibly. And here are the major proposed changes to the benefits of the regime. Firstly, the 15% income tax rate will be replaced by a 60% reduction of the income tax due after applying a 30% income tax rate. And secondly, the credit for foreign income tax paid will be replaced by a deduction. In Colombia, the tax authorities have issued guidance in regard to the impact of the Colombia-UK Treaty in triggering most favoured nation clauses in Colombia's treaties with Canada, the Czech Republic, Mexico and Portugal. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Peru, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the application of the VAT zero rating for exports of services, including examples. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. This has been a very slow week for treaty developments. All we've had is an exchange of letters interpreting the Argentina-France Treaty. I have one article for you this week. It's called The Concept of Value Creation. Is it relevant for the allocation of taxing rights? It's written by Razmi Ranjan Das and it's published in the IBFD's Bulletin for International Taxation. This article is notable because it's written by India's representative on the Inclusive Framework Steering Group, an insider's view, so to speak. In short, he thinks that the concept of value creation is not relevant for the allocation of taxing rights. The author writes this, Value creation, 
has never been the basis of the allocation of taxing rights among countries, as evidenced by the tax treaties governing such an allocation. Further, given the lack of unanimity on what the concept means and the problem of measuring the value created by an economic activity or transaction, value creation as the basis for the allocation of taxing rights is impossible to implement. The lack of consensus on the meaning can also result in chaos if value creation is implemented as a rule for taxation, as countries might interpret the concept in a way that expands their tax base. In addition, the concept may perpetuate and strengthen the existing bias in taxation towards resident countries and would therefore not be fair, at least from the perspective of a developing country. In view of the foregoing, the concept should not be used in any discussion on the allocation of taxing rights. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 6th of March, 2020. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.